Jeremiah chapter 52, the fall of Jerusalem. So basically we have been been speaking about the judgment of Jerusalem and last week we saw how God brought them back into Jerusalem and in this chapter we're going to see the fall of Jerusalem kind of an appendix to all that's been going on Uh, I find it hard to believe that people would grow apart from God especially having a relationship with God that's that's hard for me to believe Um, I can understand it and I've experienced uh, times in my life where I felt that uh, a rebellious spirit in me where, where I just felt like, okay, God, I'm just testing you. You know, if this is going to be real, you're going to somehow draw me back. I'm just going to be a little rebellious here and go do my little thing. And, and I've done that, and God has always brought me back, um, whether it's through a song, through the word, uh, something where he just uh, breaks me down through his love uh, by a display, whether it's others or, or a display towards myself concerning his love and it just always breaks me down that, that he still loves me and, and so I just come crawling right back you know I sit at his feet okay here I am what do I need to do let, let me get busy again and so it's hard for me to believe that people can literally walk away from God you know, um, why does that happen what causes that and I, I, I we can probably come up with a lot of a lot of things I was speaking with a young man today and he was trying to sell me a a um training session at the gym so I let him give me the free training one and walk through the whole thing and and afterwards he sat down and he says I I, this is what he said I noticed you you have everything down but what you really need is just just this much more and man I could bring you over the top you know if I could just be your trainer and I could sit with you and watch you and really motivate you and I said I said to him I totally agree you probably would but I'm not ready yet because I still have the injury, still not completely healed, and I don't want to mess with it. And so then I asked him, and I said, uh, when was the last time you went to church? He just looked at me, and he said, it's been a while. And I'm like, why? Why aren't you? Are you a Christian? Yeah. It's like, why haven't you been in church? If I were to ask you to, to bring God back into your life, get right with him you'd probably tell me uh i'm not ready for it right now and he starts laughing because that's what i told him about the gym and he just starts laughing and then all of a sudden he just got serious he said i've had two children and both have died of that sids we don't know why they just they just died and i'm like i just went like whoa that's I, i don't even know what to say and I tried to comfort him as much as I could, and I just really fell for him. And and he basically um, explained what what how how it pulled him away from God and from church and and so forth. Not in a rebellious way. He just needed to get away and just really focus on some other things and get things straight. And he's hoping to get back here real soon. So I I said, hey, if you have any questions, I'm here. You see me around the gym, so don't feel free to come up and and ask me, you know, anything you'd like. But, you you know, things like that, you go, yeah, okay, that makes sense that someone would pull back a little bit. But God would always pull them back. It could be sin. Judas Iscariot, it was sin in his life. Uh, There's all kinds of reasons. We know that with, with Israel, it was idolatry. They want to be like the world. And unfortunately, it's the same scenario today. The church wants to be like the world. They want, a, they, they want a church that they can go to where they don't hear about sin. They don't hear negative things. All they hear is positive things and how God wants to bless them, prosper them, how God wants to give them homes and cars, how God wants to heal them and, and, and just uh, physically and spiritually. And, and just God just wants to bless and love them. And they're loved no matter what they do. And you can drink and you can party and do all those things. And you're okay because God still loves you because God is love. And that's all they want to hear today. And that's the culture of today. Isn't the culture a culture that's designed to just speak positive? Even in the, in, in, in the public school system, don't say anything negative. You have to build their self-esteem. So always say something positive. Reinforce them, these type of things. But don't deal with their struggles or with their sins or with their flaws. God's word is different. <clears throat> it deals with those things because those are the things that keeps us away from his power and his strength to live the life. Um, it could be marriages. <clears throat> and I've seen people hide things very well in their relationships Uh, no really good friend of ours that uh, he would always say our marriage is perfect we have no problems they're divorced today 
course, they had no problems. <clears throat> he would hide it very, very, very well. And, and, and when you walk away from the Lord and you don't do what he's called you to do, it, it's going to be a struggle in your life. And what I find interesting, like with Israel, is it became so normal to them. You know, almost like it's okay to allow idols in the temple. What's the big deal? It's okay to, to feel this way. It, it's okay to be a little rebel because God's going to forgive me anyway. And unfortunately, it's not okay. Uh, we saw what happened with, with Israel. They fell back into um, idolatry and they began to distance themselves from God and truth. And um, then God again judged them by Babylon. So the book of Jeremiah concludes with a, a historical appendix that, that closely parallels <clears throat> the conclusion in 2 Kings 24, 18 through chapter 25. You see some very uh, similarities there and also in chapter 39 of Jeremiah. They say that um, this last chapter was probably not written by Jeremiah, but whoever wrote it wanted to give kind of an overview uh, of the book of Jeremiah, but also uh, what was happening at that time historically in Kings, and there in, in, in chapter 39, as I suggested. So. so let's look at the fall of Jerusalem as it ends the details of the Council Fall here in, in chapter 52, 1 through 27. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he had become king. Uh, now imagine that. How many of you would follow a 21-year-old king? You'd kind of go, okay, so what experience does he have <laughs> you know, that we would follow him? Of course, you, you know, you're used to a monarchy like that uh, where, where there's kings and kings are young. There's, and he's probably an older king. There's kings that were in, in their eight, eight-year-old, nine-year-olds, and, and they'd follow him. Of course, they'd have advisors and so forth. You know, but <clears throat> you'd follow them. You'd follow the advisors, and you'd have to because they were, they were the king. But what kind of wisdom does a child like that have? I can remember there was a time... When I was younger, hearing a lot within the Calvary Chapel churches and other churches too, that, that young people were really looked down upon and that the older people struggled with them because of that very reason. Well, how can they run a church and how can they be a pastor and, and how can they be elders? They're only 21, 22 years old. You know, they're not even old enough yet. They don't have the experience and so forth. And so there was a big struggle with that. When Chuck called a lot of these young men, they were all in their teens, many of them. Greg started his church over there in Riverside at the age of 21, right around there. And so he became a pastor of that church. You go, how could he do that? Well, there, there is another empowering uh, truth here, and that is that when God calls a man, he gives them the wisdom that he needs because the wisdom not necessarily is, is always from experience and time, and there is some that comes with that. And definitely that has to be accounted for in that individual's life. But when that young man is reading the word of God from cover to cover and he's taking it in and he's living that word and there's power there, the Lord's anointed him. And if he knows the word, he can apply the word to his life and he has more wisdom than anyone else because the, the word of God has been applicable to his life. And so he can run a church. I remember when I started this church, I was actually 33 years old. 32 and we found this building in 33 and we had an open house <clears throat> we had different groups coming in to to share with us worship and the place was just packed out at the time and uh one of the bands came in and, and they came up to me because i was also the greeter and the usher at the same time so i was uh, greeting them getting them ready and so forth and they said where's the pastor and i'm like looking you know, i'm the pastor and they looked at me like how old are you, <laughs> you know, like 33 and like well you're not old enough i go well jesus died on the cross at 33 so was he not old enough you know like well okay i guess he was <laughs> i guess he was so but yeah they they look down on you um we shouldn't despise uh, the youth you know we should encourage them and if they're teaching from the word of God and giving us counsel from the word of God. That's the wisdom right there, right? Because anybody can do that if we take the word of God. And so Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king and he reigns 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. He also did evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that Jehoiakim had done. For because of the anger of the Lord has happened in Jerusalem, and Judah till he 
finally cast them out from his presence. Then Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. Now it came to pass, and now we know up to this point, again, it's in the panic, it's going over in history. That's exactly what had happened. Zedekiah became king, and then he rebelled against Babylon, and then Babylon's going to come in and take them. And we remember how Zedekiah was having struggles with, with going to Babylon. Uh, now it came to pass in the, verse 4, the ninth year of, the, of his reign, in the tenth month on the tenth day of the month that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his armies came against Jerusalem and encamped against it, and they built a siege wall against it all around. One of the ways that, that Babylon would capture a city is by encamping against it, besieging it. And so they, they basically surrounded the whole city. Uh, and they stopped all the supplies of water and food into that city. And, and they would just wait them out. And they let, let them eat all their food, drink all their water, and let them starve. And, and when they knew that they were starving and they didn't have enough water, then they'd break a wall down and walk right in there and pretty much take them over because they're all weak. They have no strength. A lot of them are already half dead. And so it's just an easy, easy capture for them to do something like that. So that was a great plan. A great plan sometimes you'd have to wait them out for months for months just waiting you're encamped around them you don't let them come out you know as soon as they come out you send a couple of guys with us shoot some arrows at them get them back in there let them eat up their supplies and you wait i think it was tyra ezekiel talks about tyra and it it, it was uh, a nation that uh, they captured but it took them 13 years to get them they were able to to go out onto a little island in the water so they were able to get water and they were able to fish so so their supplies lasted a little longer but 13 years they waited 13 years and they finally were able to uh, destroy them verse 5 so the city was besieged until the 11th year of king zedekiah by the fourth month on the ninth day of the month the famine had become so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. And the city wall was broken through and all the men of war fled and went out of the city at night by the way of the gate between the two walls, which was by the king's garden, even through the Chaldeans or Babylonians uh, were near the city around. Uh, they went by way of the plain. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and they overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. All his army was scattered before him. So they took the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon in Riblah, in the land of Hamath, and he pronounced judgment upon him. So, you, so your typical capture, right? And then you bring everybody, and we've, again, we've been talking about this, and uh, the king's before them, and they're going to sentence them, basically. And the king of Babylon killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. And he killed all the princes of Judah in Riblah. He also put out the eyes of Zedekiah. And the king of Babylon bound him in bronze feathers, fetters, took him to Babylon and put him in prison till the days of his death. Uh, so until the days of his death, imprisonment and eventually death in prison um, was the end of King Zedekiah. So we've gone over that's in several chapters of Jeremiah. So verse 12, we have the temple and city plundered and burnt. Now in the fifth month, on the 10th day of the month, which was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, Nebuzardan, the captain of the guard who served the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem. He burned the house of the Lord and the king's house, all the houses of Jerusalem, that is, and all the houses of the great he burned with fire. Now that is the, the temple of the Lord. And we know that when, when Israel went back to Jerusalem, they would rebuild the temple. Uh, Nehemiah, Esther, uh, all, all that t uh, time was focused on building the temple itself. And then when when we come to the time of Christ, Herod then beautified the temple even even more. And then in AD 70, the temple was destroyed uh, once again, and we haven't seen it rebuilt yet. But they are talking about rebuilding it. And they are talking about the fact that the temple can go right next to the Dome of the Rock, which is the Jewish uh, temple. I don't know if you know this or not, but that, that Jerusalem and the Temple Mount is Israel's. It's, it's not the Muslim's. 
uh, land. Israel is just letting them use it because of the Dome of the Rock. They're just being nice. They can kick them out anytime they want to, but Israel's just be nice and saying, go ahead and use your Dome of the Rock and so forth. And what they're doing is they're going into the Dome of the Rock underneath and they're excavating everything and whatever's Jewish artifacts that's history, they're destroying it all. Uh, they're not even allowing them to, to take it and look at it at all. So it, it's just it's strange the way that relationship is, the anger and hatred that they have for one another. Uh, today, I believe it was the la or today is the day of beginnings in Rosh Hashan. So um, I haven't said anything um, for various reasons, but the world was supposed to come to an end uh, this weekend. I don't know if some of you knew that. Some had prophesied that it was coming to an end, but we're still here. And so uh, it didn't come to an end, and they were they were wrong because of the holidays, the blood moon and that's coming to. So there's some thoughts there uh, about uh, the end of the days. So we are in, living in interesting times. Paul was clear that um, we are in the end times, but when that day, no man knows the day or the hour when it's going to come. We will not see the temple rebuilt, though. If we start seeing the temple, we are really close to the end, really close, because that will be the temple that the Antichrist will, will use to set his throne uh, <clears throat> as the God of the world. So... So a little bit history of, of where the temple is today. By the way, they do have all the, the priest garments. They have, they have the red heifer ready to be offered up at, as sacrifices. They have all the utensils. They, they have everything that the Levitical priests needed to use to offer up the, the uh, sacrifices unto the Lord. So the only thing they're really missing right now is the temple. And so there are a lot of Christians that are pouring in a lot of money into Jerusalem and Israel and, and, and supporting them to rebuild the temple. There are actually Christian churches that think, well, if we can get them to build the temple, the Lord's going to come back, you know, so they're doing that, but, you know, God's in control. They're, they're not. So there's a great push to get that temple built, but um, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, I was in a museum, and they had a, a model uh, of the temple itself I've got some pictures and I didn't bring them tonight but I've got some pictures and it's just beautiful the way they, they design it it's all designed according to Solomon's plans and David's and so forth and, and they have pictures of the garments and all the tools so it's pretty interesting um, <clears throat> just waiting for them to build it and all the armies of the Chaldeans who were with the captains of the guard broke down all the walls of Jerusalem all around then Nebuzardan the cap captain of the guard excuse me, carried away captive some of the poor people. The rest of the people who remained in the cities, the defectors who had deserted it to, to the king of Babylon and the rest of the craftsmen. But Nebuzardan, the captain of the guards, left some of the poor of the land as vine dressers and farmers. Uh, the bronze pillars that were in the house of the Lord and the carts in the bronze sea that were in the house of the Lord the Chaldeans broke in pieces and carried all their bronze to Babylon so we, we remember that back earlier in, in the other chapters and uh, how they took everybody and, and then left some people there the poor people took the rich people you know and try to assimilate them within their own culture so just again it's just all repeat and I apologize for that but hey it's the word of God there's a reason for him to repeat um, notice the the instruments, the pillars and the carts and so forth. Those were all taken. And, and, and ladies are going to be going through the book of Daniel, right? And you're going to see that in the book of Daniel when Belshazzar, I believe it's Belshazzar, um, the, the son of Nebuchadnezzar, who will take one of the, the cups and he'll misuse it and God's going to judge him uh, for that. Um, how, do you t how do you take the things of God and, and, and defame them, you know? I mean, that's, you have to have a heart, heart. You know, recently we had somebody um, steal here in the church some, some petty cash. And, and there were some kids that uh, I was speaking to and said, hey, put out the word, you know, that we know what's going on and that they need to re either return it or repent and turn to God. And they were blown away by it. They were like, how can someone steal from the church? That didn't make any sense to them. You know? And so we started looking into the whole thing and we actually think it was an inside job. We think it was someone in the church. Yeah, and then uh, all these other thoughts, you know, well, how can that even happen? But you have to remember that Judas Iscariot was the treasurer of Jesus Christ. And Jesus made him the treasurer knowing that he was a thief too, you know. So God knows, and that's all that uh, we have to concern ourselves. But how does someone do that? 
You know, and why would Judas Iscariot do that? Why would an individual steal from his church? You know what's the number one item stolen in churches? Bibles. Why would you steal a Bible from the church? Oh, well, because they give them away, right? No, we don't give them away. <laughs> we have to buy them and replenish them because you should go buy one, right? You should go buy one. That's what's personal about God and, and our relation with him is you want to go buy your own Bible. You can write in your own Bible and it's your Bible, you know, but we live in a society as you know, hands out, you know, <laughs> can you give me one? That'd be nice, you know, and I don't have to go spend, man, spend for the Lord. Uh, someone asked me just the other day, why do we charge for studies and stuff? You know why we charge? I mean, if, if we could, we'd give it all away for free like we did the summer fest, but we charge because we have to put value to it. You have to understand that there's value to these things and it costs us something. It's not because we're getting rich because we're not. You know, it's because it should cost us something. We should understand there's value to it. And we've lost that concept of things have value. And when they have value, what do you do? You take care of those things. If I give you a Bible, you know what most people do with it? Just throw it out because they didn't pay for it anyway. So there's really no value to it. And so it's a way of teaching us that things have value. All these things are gods. The way we treat them are important because they're gods. They're not ours. This grounds is God. The building is God. The, uh, everything that's in here is God's. And so we should treat all this stuff as though it's his and we shouldn't mistreat it. Would you go into someone's house and just start throwing things around? No, you wouldn't do that. Why would you do that in church and when it's God's home, God's place for us to come together, you know, and so forth. But the Babylonians took everything. They just grabbed everything in the temple and they stole it took it all and took it to babylon whatever was gold whatever was bronze whatever was silver especially because it was worth something um, we have to put value to it uh, the studies and so forth yes it helps uh maintain the lights because the ladies are here on tuesdays and wednesdays the men's on mondays and and so forth so it helps pay with some of the uh the electricity and the bills and the mortgage and so forth. That's how we maintain to open these doors. You know, that's important, right? That we open these doors. You know, I want to grow. Why? So that we can we, we, we can reach this community even more with, with greater opportunities. Um, we don't want to stay small. We want to be able to reach them with the gospel message. And in order to do that, we need support. We need people to invest. We need people to understand there's value in that, even value in the gospel message itself. And it takes resources to, to get it out there. We just can't poof, come up with it, you know? It, it comes with people who understand God, who love his word and say, I want to apply the word of God to my life. I really do in every aspect of it. And that's what a Christian does. It changes his life. He becomes born again. The old things have passed away. Believe me, I was a stingy, stingy guy. I remember we would go to church, you know, and in, in the Catholic church, they had these little baskets with the felt inside of it, and they passed the baskets along the aisles, and you just keep passing it. Or they had these baskets with poles on them, and the, the guy had it in his hand, and he'd reach all the way over there and pull it all the way back, you know, as you were giving. And I would literally, okay, I'm get in my pocket, and I'd find a quarter, a nickel, and I'd go, oh, I'm like, let's put in a quarter, a nickel, and that's it. Because I always felt, oh, they got plenty of money. You know, they got plenty of resources, you know, so they're trying to take my money. I'm trying to feed my kids, you know, and that's how I thought. So I'd throw a nickel in there, a nickel. <laughs> I, you know, I'd spend $5 on lunch every day. And once a week, I'd throw a nickel in there, and I'd feel, okay, they got my money, you know, a nickel, really? And then i come to the Lord, and i read his word, and I was like, tithing? Oh, boy, what's, what's that about? And, and how it's God's, it's not mine's. I put a quote in the bulletin this week is uh, that we should pray, Lord, help us to be wise with 90% of the money we have, 90%. If we can't be wise with 90%, how are you going to be wise with even 100%? Think about that. That's only 10% more. So if you're unwise, it's, it's not God's fault. It's your fault for not trusting in God. Trust in God and watch what he will do. And so I just started tithing. And that's what Christians do because they want to see God's gospel go out to the world. So they were stealing everything from it, took everything. And in verse 18 says they took away the, the pots, the shovels, the trimmers, the bowls, the spoons, all the bronze utensils with which the priests ministered. The basins, the fire pans, the bowls, the pots, the lampstands, the spoons, and the cups, whatever was solid gold, whatever was solid silver, the captains of the guard took away. 
the two pillars. They even, they even took the pillars themselves. Uh, pillars are interesting. These pillars here were 27 feet high, and about eight feet wide, and they're hollow inside. Um, when you see some of these Roman pillars, like they're actually in pieces. That's why when you see them fall in, they're li like little chunks kind of falling down because they put them in pieces and they put them on top of each other. Then they cover them with a stucco substance and then and then give them their their design so that it looks like they're really one piece. But they took those too. They were so beautiful. They wanted them for for wherever they were going to use them. Maybe at one of the captains' homes. Uh, one C, the twelve bronze bulls which were under it, the carts which King Solomon had made for the house of the Lord. The bronze of all these articles was beyond measure. Uh, Solomon, that's how far back the history was going, all the way to Solomon who had made some of these carts for the house of the Lord and they took them and probably destroyed many of those things just like they're doing today. Now concerning the pillars, the height of one pillar was 18 cubics. A measure line of 12 cubics uh, could measure its circumference. And its, thick, its thickness was four fingers. Uh, it was hollow. So he's giving us the, the instrument, the, the measurements there. A cubic was, they measured a cubic usually from the fingers to their elbows. And that's what they considered a cubic. And most people have about 18 inches or so. It varies from 18 to maybe 21. So right around there, 18 to 21 inches was considered a cubic. And so when it, it says here that it was 18 cubics, so 18 of these, that's how tall it was, about 27 uh, feet tall. And fingers, so you're talking four fingers, you know, fingers of a man might be a little smaller, but not much. So you're talking two inches thick, two, two and a half inches thick, those pillars were. The captain of bronze was on it, and the height of one capital was five cubics, with a network of pomegranates all around the capital uh, and all of bronze. The second pillar was pomegranates with the same there were 96 pomegranates on the sides. All the pomegranates all around on the network were 100. Now, verse 24, the people are taken captive into Babylon. The captains of the guards took Shirah, the chief priest, uh, Zephaniah, the second priest, and the, third, and the three doorkeepers. He also took out of the city an officer who had charge of the men of war, seven men of the king's close associates who were found in the city, the principal scribe of the army who mu mustered the people of the land and 60 men of the people of the land who were found in the midst of the city. And Nebuzardan, the captain of the guards, took these and brought them to the king of Babylon at Ripla. Then the king of Babylon struck them and put them to death at Ripla in the land of Hamath. Thus Judah was carried away captive from its own land. Then we have the exile here. Um, the number of people taken into exile, we can find that recorded here in, in verses 28 through 30 with the years that are counted in the Babylonian uh, numbers. These are the people whom Nebuchadnezzar carried away captive in the seventh year, 3,023 Jews. In the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar, he carried away captive from Jerusalem 832 persons. In the 23rd year of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, the captain of the guards, carried away captive of the Jews 745 persons. All the persons were 4,600 people. So quite a few people were taken away. Now it came to pass... In the 37th year of the captivity of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 25th day of the month, that evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the first year of his reign, lifted up the head of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, and brought him out of prison. Now, who is this guy, Merodach? Um, he is um, Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, is, is the um, succeeding 
king of evil Merodach. So it, he was before Merodach as king at that time. And Jehoiachin was one of the ones that uh, divided the children of Israel, Judah, from the northern and southern kingdom, the very beginning when he wanted to worship God his way. Now it came to pass in the um, 27th year of the captivity of Jehoiachin, Jehoiachin, king of Judah, in the twelfth month, on the twenty-fifth day of the month, that evil Merodach, king, king of Babylon, the first year of his reign, lifted up the head of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, and brought him out of prison. And he spoke kindly to him, gave him a more prominent seat than those of the kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiachin charged from his prison garment, changed his pr from his prison garments, and he ate bread regularly before the king all the days of his life. And then we come to the last verse, which is interesting. I kind of titled it the new start here. So after all of the struggles and conquests and, and that were taking place, uh, God just kind of uh, gives, a, again, a confirmation to the promise that he made to Israel that uh, his people will, will still be around. It says, and as for the, his provisions, there was a regular ration given him by the king of Babylon, a portion for each day until the day of his death, all the days of his life. And so he was taken care of, and so uh, many of the commentaries uh, felt like it's God way of saying the Davidic line will continue on and we know that it did all the way until Jesus Christ came himself.